Stay hungry, stay foolish. So now on the Innovation Show, we welcome John Phelan, National Director for the H-Ban Network and Chair for Animation Ireland. Welcome to the show, John. Thanks, Aidan. Good to see you again. So you're <laughs> a little dig in there. <laughs> I know, it's, you're not the only one. This is one of those nine famous interviews that were deleted. Um, I'm, you see, the way I, make, I make it objective where deleted, not by someone. Um, thanks for coming back in again, John. Thanks for your time. Uh, it'd be great to understand what, what H-Ban Network is and what it does. Uh, thanks, Aidan. I suppose uh, HBAN, uh, in a nutshell, is a dating agency. It's the easiest way to, to explain it. Uh, HBAN is the Halo Business Angel Network, or the All Island Network, for business angels um, uh, to create that community, as was the idea. Uh, what we do is we bring high net worth individuals who are looking to invest in reasonably early stage companies. And that's on one side of the equation. And then on the other side of the equation, we, we, we bring good companies that have great potential with good promoters. And we qualify the deal flows that comes through. So we might get four to 500 uh, applications a year. We typically put between 50 and 100 of those in front of angels. So the angels know they're getting good deal flow every year. So that's very important to them. An example I give you is that one of the, the, the angel forums I run just down the road here, uh, we had 50 companies last year that were presented um, uh, over the year. Uh, 32 of those have now been invested in, uh, 15 of them through our own network and 17 of them outside our network. Frankly, I don't care as long as they get invested, but the, what, it's, what it's showing is that the quality of the deal flowed up 60 plus percent get invested in which is a huge hit rate um and it's great for our investors to hear that and see that uh that the quality is that good from a deal perspective what kind of stuff are you looking for so if i'm somebody sitting at home and i have an idea what are you looking for like what what strikes me off the list automatically and what gets me on the list uh, if you're the company side of the equation uh what we want to see is a company that has uh scalability uh, and real potential. So scalability in our world will be how do you scale technology typically? Uh, and it has potential to go global and scale up quite fast with quite limited capital costs. So for example, something that's a tangible good is quite difficult because you've got to invest in the, the, the inventory and everything else. Whereas if you have an enterprise software play, you actually have, you build it, but the cost then is really just your sales. You don't have a cost of sales. So the capital costs actually scale it up um, and your gross margin, your, your your gross profit tends to tends to reflect that. And we'd be looking for that. Yeah, so basically your cloud storage or something like that would be the only thing that gets bigger as yeah. you get bigger. So you can scale it. Yeah, that's brilliant. Uh, and I suppose a lot of our investors will come from that world and they would understand how to do that and they would understand where the customers are and how to get those customers on board. And that's really important that they bring the smarts to the table. That's not just cash. Yeah. So to put it into into um, layman's terms, so Dragons Den, for example. So yeah. you're looking for the network to ba basically bring good dragons or suitable dragons yeah. to the table who know the this space, yeah. and they tend to back the horses that they're familiar with. Yeah, and I, I say it to all the angels coming in. I say. Um, you're better off sticking to the sectors you know and understand. Because typically what happens is that a lot of the companies that come in to us are well prepped. Uh, we have a whole team that preps them before they actually get in front of angels so that they're really investor ready. So through the, the Irish Business Innovation Centre, the BICs, the companies are, cre are, are brought to a stage where they're investor ready. We then have another team that brings them to presenter ready at that investor ready level so that they can stand up, they can pitch they can pitch really well. They have the content's really strong. The structure of the pitch is really strong. They have a 10 minute presentation. They've got to get that 10 minute hook in to get people interested. If they don't, if they don't get that, they're out of the game. So it's a really important exercise and they should put a lot of time into that. We had Michael Culligan in from, from Dublin Big before and he was mm -hmm. saying that you do a lot of work to basically coach 
the companies through. So they're not coming in and, and expecting to be amazing presenters straight away because you often you have the great idea guys mm -hmm. who aren't very comfortable presenting mm -hmm. or talking about the company. So you kind of either match make them with somebody who is or you coach them through those phases. Yeah, and you try and do either or, or both um, because typically what we'd like to see is somebody who's got a great technology background and understands technically how they're going to do what they say they're going to do. And then on the other side of the equation, you need somebody who's commercially savvy and understands how to bring that tech, communicate where the value is and understands how to get into the market and onboard customers. Uh, and, and as you said, Dublin Big with Michael Culligan, and um, what Dublin Big would do is bring them to, they challenge them on all their beliefs and basically beat the hell out of them, which is a bit of tough love, um, as I like to call it. And, and I think that system works well because it preps them for the real world uh, but we do it in a safe environment where we can say things which a lot of other people can't uh, a lot of the consultants in Dublin BIC would come from the sectors that they get assigned to the companies so they'd have a deep understanding of, of what the, the market is looking for where the problems are how you're going to get into the market all that kind of good stuff that you'd expect out of a normal business where the typically the early stage guys just haven't had that experience. Um, so we try and help them on that front as well. Yeah, so that, uh, like it's almost drilling drilling skills in to, before the big game. Yeah. And, and um, in that, so I, like, I, I hate for people to get scared off by it. So if, I, if I'm a guy, I'm coming in, I have an idea. Will, will you help me put a team together? So you might go, listen, before you even present this, like the idea. Before you present this, we yeah. need we need you to have a chief marketing officer, or we need you to have uh, you're a great you're a great business guy or yeah. business development guy. We need a technical guy beside you before you present because the the do, do the angels look at the team? Oh yeah, absolutely they do um, because the team and the promoters are are, are what you're backing really. Um, the idea is one part of that equation, but ultimately it comes down to if the 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 main promoter and the team can't execute on it. The whole thing's going to fall apart. And what? Who's the promoter in that? Is the promoter the idea person? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the promote. So you have the promoter, you have the team, and then you have HBAN behind being the coach, essentially. Correct. Yeah. Okay. So. Oh, I mean, all we do is support the guys. I mean, we, we don't want to take their their glory. Yeah. Um, we are really just that that coaching element. Yeah. Um, and we prepare them so that they can step up to the mark. And our only goal is that they get funded. Yeah, and we want to see them do that. We want to see them succeed. Yeah. So you, so basically, you're, what you're, what you're doing is going to, in a Tinder world, you're going and you're, you're scouting <laughs> both sides of the market, you're sliding everywhere, <laughs> you're sliding left and right. <laughs> yeah. So you're, you're, but you're actually building the market as well. So you're building the supply side and the demand side. Yeah, and it's taken us a long time to do that. Yeah. I mean, we've been doing this for eight, nine years now, and uh, when we started off, it it was a startup, and when we had. Very, very limited resources. We had very little limited profile access to the market. We didn't know how many angels there was in the country. Um, we now have a recent report from Intertrade Ireland saying that they believe there's somewhere between 120 and 170 million uh, available each year in the, the angel economy in Ireland, of which HBAN, we would have brought 10 million to the table last year. So there's still a lot out there going on. And I suppose what I'd like to do is say, right, can we build that to 20 million uh, at least? But bring into into our sphere um, more angels who will get better deal flow and better qualified deal flow, so that they get a better chance at a better return. Yeah. So, okay. So, so you mentioned about uh, it took you a long time to to get there. Yeah. So, can can we talk about you then for a second and and how you got there? So, how yourself because you've <laughs> you've a very interesting background. Um, I mentioned your chair of animation Ireland, so you've obviously a creative streak or a passion there as well. So, can we talk about that and, and how yeah, you, sure. how you got to where you are? That's why. Yeah, we can. Aiden, it might take a while. <laughs> <laughs> I have coffee here. <laughs> I, I suppose my first career was was animation and games. Um, so I started doing that. Um, uh, back in nineteen eighty seven, uh, I started in Sullivan Bluth like a lot of people in the animation world in, in Ireland. Um, when anima when Sullivan Bluth shut shop and it, and it was a great, uh, it was a great institution. It was a great place to be. I, I actually met, I went there on a school tour uh, <laughs> when I was in school, like sixth, sixth year and it was awesome. I remember just being mesmerized yeah. by, you know, the creativity and the process. But the process actually blew me away. It was like, because you, you think of when you're that age, you think it's drawing and yeah. then you see 
the process and the, the precise process of well, everything. There's 22 different departments. And of those 22 different departments, they all had a different approval stage within each one. So I describe it, 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 it's, it's a sausage factory, that production process. Uh, and it is a very well defined process. And I think what they did very well was they, they had the processes well worked out and defined. And I think that's helped all the studios here because now with the, with the studios here, would understand how to do a commercial process and from A to B. So get it from the creative bit and get it out to the, the to get the show out on tape or whatever. But essentially they, the professionalization of a process as opposed to a creative artistic drawing part of it, is, it's a very big difference. Yeah. Um, and you and you've brought that uh, experience because we've had um, Dan Spencer from from Giant yes. Animation mm. on. Uh, you know, I've, ta- I've talked to Cahill Gaffney, and th- that that is very much in the mindset of of the companies. And, and you know, people think of them they're just creative places, yeah. but they actually become technology uh, institutions who are do creative. Yeah, well, you know? I I I, th- I, th- I think why Ireland is doing so well in the animation world is that the infrastructure and the professionalization of the management side of it. Uh, has been embraced and I do genuinely think the technology that the guys are embracing and using making things faster cheaper uh, and getting it turning it around quicker which means the budgets come down means that broadcasters and those who are financing shows can see uh, they're getting better value by coming here not just that the the talent in terms of the artists and the creatives are, are all there as well but also that it's it's supported by this infrastructure of technology, professional management, and they can turn it around. And the attitude and the culture is good. Yeah, because uh, look, I had the the, the fortune to to visit uh, both Dan and Giant and also uh, uh, Brownback and the servers on, on site and stuff yeah. like that. So there's intelligence there beyond you know I, I, t- the guys have thought about the whole process and it's just fantastic I just think I was just blown away by it and uh, but we we'll, we'll go back to the timeline so you're in, you're in uh, Sullivan Blue that's where where your creative juices started flowing yeah yeah and then listen I was a kid um, it was all great fun um, the average age I think was about 22 so there's lots of energy in the place and they went through I suppose their own uh, ups and downs uh, and eventually wound up in 95 uh, in 94, um, I ended up going to Warner Brothers in the UK. Um, Warner Brothers, we did Space Jam and a few others with Michael Jordan over there. Great exposure to the UK scene. After about 18 months, Warner Brothers said, ah, it's too expensive here. We're leaving. So I said, uh, that's good. Can I take all your desks and equipment and 40 staff down the road and, and I'll subcontract from the States, all the other stuff. Brilliant. So we did. And, and what what was your role to to be able to do that uh, at the time? Well, I set up my own company. Yeah, but what what in it within, within, within Sutherland Brewers and then Warner's? Yeah, within Warner's, I was uh, I was on the production side. So okay, I was production manager. Wow. Um, so so you spotted the opportunity. Yeah, yeah. I said, hey, and and actually, what came about was uh, the network from the Sullivan Bluth days. Who a couple of guys in LA had said that. Uh, our studio is looking for outsource work. Do you want to do it? And we ended up doing a million bucks in our first year. Uh, so it, it was it was a great. Yeah. Uh, and you're 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 still in your twenties then. I, I was my I was twenty five, twenty six. Yeah, early twenty. Uh, yeah. I had no idea what I was doing. Brilliant, uh, frankly. Um, and I suppose for the, the 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 four or five years we we had, we did that, and that company actually, strangely enough, was called Giant. Uh, which I always like the, the <laughs> off with. but uh, so we 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 had a studio called Giant where we did a lot of service work for the states for the the large studios for 20th Century Fox, DreamWorks, uh, Warner's, and we started doing commercials and we started doing some TV projects and doing a lot of co-pros with German companies, Spanish companies, and everything else. So I suppose there, there was a a huge amount of learning there. Um, the learning from my side was that. This is not just a creative process. Actually, you have to professionalize this. And that opened my eyes a, a lot. Um, I also saw at the time that Toy Story came out and I could see how that was killing the 2D world, which is the hand-drawn world, which is what we had come out of. And, and I think, frankly, we were quite snobby about uh, 2D versus 3D. And we got caught up in, in all that. And... Uh, uh, again, the, the, all that 
all that technology can be very humbling when you realise how wrong you are. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's good to, to get a kick in the ass every so often. Um, but after that, I went to the States to, to head up a, a game studio, um, which was a mixture, again, of a lot of creative artists on one side of the house. And it was it was a split like that. On one side of the house was all the artists doing all the pictures. And then on the other side of the house was all the dev heads coding um, in their caves. Yeah. And uh, it was like, how do you bring these two cultures together and get them working together and doing what we needed to do? And all our clients were Disney, Mattel, Warners again. So... It was a good, again, it was yeah. great learning. Um, March 2001 came along. Um, the dot bomb blew the hell out of that market because the, the, the games publishing market, that, that business model changed. Um, I came back from that um, because all our clients reined in all their funds and said, we don't know where this, this market's going to be, so we're not spending anymore. And we were doing between whatever, seven to 10 million a year at that stage. Um, so when I came back here, I said, Right, I'm going to get out of here. This and I had a family, so uh, we said uh, we want to we want to stay in Ireland. How are we going to do that? So I went back to school, and uh, went back to to college and did my MBAs, my QFAs, uh, my corporate financey stuff. And uh, uh, so it was a far, a far cry from the creative stuff you were doing. It was, but at the uh, wh- why I went back to do that was I identified there was a lot of things I knew uh, about setting up a business doing the creative side, everything else. But where I felt I really didn't understand was how do you, how do you assess a market, an industry and see where it's going? Uh, And how do you position yourself to be a leader in that market rather than being a laggard who who floats on the the coattails of everybody else and then gets murdered at the end of it, which is what I saw happening in the animation industry. I saw close on 5,000 people losing their livelihoods who were 2D artists because they didn't read the market. Um, and I just wanted to understand that. I wanted to understand how do you actually assess a market and how do you uh, see where it's going to be in three to five years' time so that you can aim to, to, to lead that as opposed to follow it up. It's, it's a, I mean, that mindset is very rare when you were, when you had that because businesses are still struggling with that and still mm-hmm. don't do that. And innovation programs, despite innovation programs, they still don't do that. And it's what resonated with me was what you said about the tech team in one silo and the creative team in another silo. We see that still in so many companies. And I, I Pixar didn't Steve Jobs. He, he he challenged that by putting the coffee shop in the middle to create this kind of watering hole yeah. that everybody would come together yeah. and graze together on well, the pasture. And I suppose that, that as much as a myth, I'm not saying that the Steve Jobs yeah. one, saying, and it is a myth that that they, they are two different cultures that need to be kept separate. Um, they just naturally drift into that. Yeah, because if you allow it to drift, it will. Whereas if you mix it up and bring them together, and you bring that diversity together, they start finding that they have things in common and that they should be talking to each other, and then it all works fine. Yeah. But you just yeah, it's a good it's breaking point. Breaking down those barriers. Yeah, on a constant basis. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, um, sorry, back to back to the timeline. So you, that, <laughs> that was really, I mean, the, the the mindset you had was so advanced in 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 a way that you were doing the reasons you were doing. It, I mean, people go and do an MBA or a finance degree to understand finance or business or because they can. You know, it's not it's not what a really defined purpose that you seem to have. Yeah. Um, and it, it's it's becoming apparent the, the more we hear from you, John, is that how you've created the the mindset you have and where you are is actually just perfect for that mindset. Yeah, I, I suppose when you get all when you get a, quite a lot of setbacks and you see an industry's going down that you're quite passionate about, um, it is a humbling experience. It does it does require you to reflect on it and and to be very open about it. Um, because the people's livelihoods are, are at stake here and people have lost jobs uh, and worse. So, uh, yeah, I think be open, share the love, as I keep saying to everybody. It's funny because that, that um, and it's something I hadn't heard before, but we had Porik Okeji on the show um, a couple of weeks back and he talked about when you have those constant setbacks, it creates these new synapses in your brain almost where yeah. you don't see them anymore. You actually just don't see those kind of obstacles because you become, I suppose your skin hardens a little bit, your, your mental skin, you kind of yeah. get a bit harder to those, but also your your warning signals or your radar or yeah. it becomes stronger for 
potential threats. Yeah, I suppose it's a bit like if you go back to your, your rugby days, Aidan. I mean, the more you train um, and the more you observe and the more your coaches tell you that, look out for this, this and this, and then you, you do it the first couple of times, it can be quite a struggle to do it and you, you, might, you, you might mess it up and that's fine. But then it becomes part of your, your toolkit and you just do it and you don't even realise you're doing it. So the, the more you challenge yourself to do things that you don't feel comfortable doing, uh, I think my own experience would be that you do, it becomes part of the norm. And then once it's part of the norm, it just gets it just gets done. You don't even think about yeah. it. Whereas if you always say, no, I'm not going to do that because that's difficult, it'll always be difficult. That's a really good point because um, brain scientists talk about that actually and they, they say that uh, – you know, habits are formed because your brain wants to save energy. That's an energy saving machine. So it actually okay. it actually <laughs> saves those things as habits. Yeah. And uh, the other thing was with threats, because um, I always used, when I coached rugby, I talked about this was, uh, if you ask somebody who was in a violent attack oh. about the incident, they'll remember the weapon. They won't remember what the person looked like usually, but they remember the weapon because the brain is trained to, to look for the most dangerous threat first. And okay, yeah. in, a, in a rugby uh, setup, you kind of what, what I was training the guys to do was if they're coming to a ruck. So apologies for anybody who doesn't <laughs> like rugby or not. But, but when they're coming to a breakdown to identify where the biggest threat is coming from the opposition, yeah. because if you do that, you will see it like you did. Yeah. You'll see those threats coming down the line in any any, any facet. And then you, yeah. you create a, a habit of them and then you just see them always. So yeah. it's, it's really. But, but then you move on to the next one. Yeah, you build up. Uh, you, you would hope that you get up to a higher plane in terms of your, your levels of understanding. Yeah. So, yeah, I think constantly challenging yourself yeah. and moving on up is, is good. So so then you, you completed the MBA. What was the next step? Uh, then I did QFA, which is Qualified Financial Advisor, uh, and then Corporate Finance. Um, and I suppose my rationale for all of those was that I was getting very stuck into the early stage companies um, through, through the likes of Dublin Bake. Um, I, I just really enjoyed it. Uh, I really enjoyed the challenge of not understanding what the hell was going on and meeting guys who didn't understand what the hell was going on. Um, but then having a framework around how to assess what they were trying to do um, and being able to create a business model with them. Uh, I, I suppose the, the alma mater from here will be Mark Little in terms of Storyful and, and, and how we... Uh, sat in a room and, and beat the hell out of each other for, for several months trying to figure out what the business model was and it eventually came down to something very simple um, which which was uh, syndicated news just coming out of different uh, sources uh, but it took us six months to get to that yeah. uh, and we went through a whole different lots of different cycles of that yeah. um, and doing that with lots of different people in lots of different sectors I just find it stimulating. I think it's really interesting. It's really challenging to, yeah. to try and sort it out and to try and help them. It keeps you awake at night, gets you up early in the morning, just trying to uh, figure out what's the solutions here. Yeah. Um, so I do that with all the early stage guys, but then the later stage companies. So I work with quite a lot of later stage companies as well, which would be the 10 to 20 million companies who are well established, but they need a strategy for uh, for growth from where they are. And typically where they are, they are in a mature uh, uh, sector which needs they need to understand how do they differentiate themselves from the competition how do they reposition themselves what's the new uh, lines of, of product or service going to be and how are they going to do all that uh, and it's a very different mindset because you've got a lot deeper cultural issues to, 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 to look at um, and then you've got to move the technology, you've got to move the culture, you've got to move the politics, and then you've got all the competition around it. So it's it's all just interesting sort of how do you put this whole jigsaw together to create something which the whole company recognises is the right way to go, and they're with you. Yeah. And that's not easy to do. Well, yeah, but I mean, listening to you to this morning, you understand, I mean, you have serious credibility there because you've you've been – it's not always about the successes. It's not about the successful things. It's actually from, you know, witnessing and being part of the, the, the crashes. And, you know, as you see the crashes and burns and seeing the, the, the murder on the dance floor that you've seen <laughs> is, uh, is um, you know, I mean, that leaves the scars that you actually want to avoid in the future. And, the, you know, the, the financial stuff, I thought it was really interesting, John, that you've done that because, 
you know, I, I, I struggle with that. I kind of go, I hate business plans because, and you know, a lot of times people in entrepreneurship and innovation kind of go, oh yeah, you don't need a business plan, but you need to understand and assess the market. If, if you're, if you're trying to, to get a million quid out of somebody, I, I think you should do them the, the honor of at least understanding your market. Um, by going in and saying that I have a great idea, um, and give me a million quid, I, I, I don't think respects their money or their time even. Um, if you want to prove it, you've got to show them that you understand where the real opportunity is. And that means you've got to understand what the competition is doing. You've got to understand how big the marketplace is. You've got to understand where the margins are. You've got to understand the pricing. You've got to understand what differentiates you. And you've got to understand the value proposition. A lot of those things probably second nature to you and I now, but I know a lot of people coming through at the first time wouldn't understand that. Yeah. And, and, and that's absolutely fine. That's just a stage of development. Yeah. So, so hopefully we can help them to, to understand what the expectations will be. But what I have seen in the last five years even is the maturity of the, uh, the startup market, both on the company side, but also on the, the, the investor side. And I think it has matured greatly over the last couple of years. The expectations from both sides have professionalized. And yeah. I think that's great. But it's all, it's also, I mean, and uh, tip of the cap to H Bank and Dublin Bick and and all the other entities because there's, there's that paying it back as well. And I, I, I go going back to the rugby as well. I, I see that as well in rugby where ex players now are coaching, yeah. ex professional players are coaching, and that's a huge difference from mm. what what was happening 10, 20 years ago. Last question for you, John. So, if I am a, a guy with an idea. And I'm, and I'm going, okay, I need to distill those ideas down into five slides. Yeah. <clears throat> what should those five slides say? If you go onto the HBAN website, uh, we have a new video up there. Uh, and the new video actually shows you exactly what you need to do in your presentation. It shows you what the content should have. It shows you what the structure should be. And it shows you how you should deliver it. So if you get those three things right, uh, and you deliver it with energy and passion, not overpassionate, confident, but not cocky. Uh, you're setting yourself up for a good presentation with potential investors. Okay, and, wh- and what's the site? H- it's www.hban.org. Dot org. Okay. Well, John Phelan, National Director for HBAN and Chair for Animation Ireland. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Aidan. Good to see you. So now on the Innovation Show, we welcome Director of Startup Ireland, Andrew Parrish. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Hi, Aidan. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you on the show. And we're ahead of a great event that's happening on Spike Island. And what's really interesting about this event is it's much different than your typical startup pitch session that's become a la mode now and, and has almost been watered down into much different thing than it was originally meant to be. And can you tell us what the difference with this event is and the details of it, please? Sure. Well, I think it's probably important to say that this event uh, is happening in the context of a much bigger thing, which is the Global Startup Nations Summit, which is coming to Ireland, coming to Cork. And in fact, it's the first time in its history that it's been in Europe. So it's a pretty big deal when you've got 200 of the world's startup policymakers, community leaders, um, uh, entrepreneurs and investors coming to Ireland because they recognize that something is happening here uh, at the startup level, which is interesting. And they're coming to share their experiences and to learn and see what's happening. But all of that's at a policy level or a macro level. So it actually has very little relevance to the startup that's trying to build a business. So what we're doing in parallel to that event and taking the impetus of the world's startup um, uh, focus coming to Ireland is we're running a very different kind of event. And I suppose what we see happening very often is you know, week after week, another startup event you know, with the same sort of format, the same sort of pitch competitions, the same um, panel discussions and PowerPoint presentations. And what we want to do is something that's a lot more fundamental to the hardcore nuts and bolts of running a business, which is tough. It's about being resilient. It's about picking yourself up when you fall and you scrape your knees and you have to go again. It's about trying to raise funding to get you through to the next uh, waypoint in your business. It's, it's, it's real fundamental stuff. So what we're doing is we're, we're, we've actually taken over Spike Island uh, in Cork Harbour for the weekend, and we're turning it into Startup Island. Um, what we have done is we have we opened uh, the uh, island for applications, and we have assessed companies and handpicked the best startup companies that we've seen apply. And we've picked them on the basis that they're actually in the market, they're making 
revenue. They're making mistakes in their business by virtue of the fact that they're actually at a point in their life cycle where they're engaging in the marketplace. But they've also demonstrated the right kind of attitude. And that attitude is about um, sharing, collaborating, recognizing that they can't do this on their own, recognizing that you know, in order to, to succeed, they typically need help. So it's fantastic the, the mindset that you're, you're setting this up in, in that it's not about the unicorn, it's more about the cockroach, it's about the hard worker, the person that's not all about the fluff. I'm sure when you selected these, these hand-picked companies, a lot of it to do was, was attitude rather than just the product. Absolutely. And, it, and it's not that kind of, you know, I'm invincible, I'm going to change the world and I'm going to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg attitude. It's more about that, you know, I'm working really hard to try and build my business. I know I don't know it all. I know there are other people out there that know things that I don't know. And I actually want to learn from them. So the whole basis of putting uh, these startups in a secure facility, you know, Spike Island is a, is a star-shaped fortress. It's over 200 years old, magnificent uh, location. The idea of putting these startups in an environment where they are secure, they're away from the public gaze, they're not on show, and they can actually self-assemble into a number of different themes which cover the fundamentals of running a business, you know, self-resilience, um, leadership, uh, raising funding, selling skills, telling your story and marketing, and how to use people and networks to maximize your your, your opportunities. So by self-assembling in a group where they can share the screw-ups they've made, the mistakes, the failures, the challenges that they face every day, in a group of other entrepreneurs who can share their experiences and maybe provide some help and support, but also, you know, peppering that group with a number of really, really expert facilitators, business leaders, uh, mentors who have been there and done that. And a couple of them, for example, would include uh, Chris Payton, who runs an organization which helps both large companies and small companies to war game their business strategy. So how do you develop a sustainable, resilient business model? Well, you war game it. And this guy knows a little bit about war gaming because he used to be a colonel in the Royal Marines and ran military strategy in Afghanistan for a number of years. So in that environment, you've got to make sure your strategy is right because failure is not an option. And very many startups almost assume that failure is okay. And what he's trying to bring is that kind of, let's focus on the mission, let's organize yourself, pivot, change, you know, protect your, yourself uh, as you would in a military environment but make sure you're, you've got your eyes firmly on the goal. We right. actually have a separate uh, guy coming from the US who's a former Green Beret captain, um, and he specializes on, on leadership and self-reliance. Um, and this is a guy that's built like a jockey. He's five foot five um, and used to lead six foot eight gorillas into battle <laughs> for, the, for the, the Green Berets. So he knows a little bit about you know, leadership uh, that's not based on physical force and strength. Uh, and what he does now is he takes um, corporate level CEOs and Green Berets that are about to leave the service away on expeditions. And he, ta he taps into that kind of you know, focus on the mission that the military guys have and the commercial you know, strategic view that the business guys have and brings them together over 10 days walking through Patagonia or in Death Valley you know, in kind of pretty extreme conditions. So he's kind of like a, a corporate Bear Grylls. That's brilliant. The startups are getting such amazing experience here that any company that's being disrupted today, because we're all being disrupted, would do really, really well to get this experience and to get all that out, outside in experience. And this has all been facilitated by Startup Ireland. Sure. So, so Startup Ireland is uh, an organization which is philanthropically funded. It's a community based initiative. We want to act as a voice for startups. Um, and, and really, it's about you know, and, and Startup Ireland is, is fundamentally staffed and, uh, and you know, the volunteers involved are all business people. So they understand what it takes to build a business. Where I think maybe you know, if, if, you know, to, to your point around the kind of companies that should or could come to the island over the next couple of days, um, we've called it Startup Island. But in truth, it's more about scale up island. And in fact, you know, we are looking at next year um, kind of changing this. So we do bring it uh, to a higher level potentially and have different levels of companies coming. Because as you say, the kind of tools and techniques that you learn in terms of leadership, resilience, wargaming, your strategy, they apply to any business. And I think maybe this is to the point that a lot of people who, are work, who work in kind of the startup sector, for want of a better phrase, kind of treat startups like, you know, junior businesses or you know when they grow up they'll be a business but the truth of it is most startup ceos and founders are smart people that are building a business they happen to be called startups 
but it's still a business. And we've got to treat them like business people and stop treating them like you know, children you know, playing in the kindergarten. I always tip my cap to the bravery of startups because, I mean, so much sacrifice involved and a, a mindset of, you know, jumping off the cliff and, and building a plane on the way down and the sacrifice of, of so many startups that I've met. People have mm-hmm. remortgaged their home and really burnt the boats to actually go to battle and, and start something new while, you know, sitting in a corporate job while it uh, is valid and all that. Is, is a much safer place to be. It, it, it's always a much safer place to be. And I think, you know, what was interesting over the last number of years in Ireland where we went through kind of the financial crisis is people that were sitting in those comfortable jobs got let go. You know, they were working in big companies that downsized and found themselves in a situation where they didn't have that safety net anymore and didn't have another job to go into. So interestingly, a lot of those, or some of those, um, through no choice of their own, became self-employed and became entrepreneurial. So you're seeing, I think, a new class of entrepreneurs who are a bit older, um, maybe have a bit more responsibility in terms of family and mortgage, etc., that are now starting businesses and working hard to scale them. But they're doing that with a much greater sense of um, the existential threat that goes with being a startup. Because if you're straight out of college, uh, don't have a mortgage, don't have a wife, don't have kids, it's kind of relatively easy to go into a startup and you might get you know, 50 grand from an accelerator and that keeps you in noodles and beer for the first year and you can build your business model. If you're 38, you know, mortgage kids, you know, your sense of risk is, is much more acute. So you will think really hard and you'll put a lot more j- diligence into your startup plan uh, because you don't want it to fall over. And that's, you know, those are the kind of people that we're seeing come to this island who really want the skill set that comes from you know, business people that have been around the block a couple of times. You know, Chris is one. Um, we have Brian Caulfield from Draper Esprit, you know, probably the most you know most successful venture capital investor in the country. I mean, the stories, the practical stories that Brian has seen from companies like Movidius, from Data Hug, you know, companies that, that he's built and scaled himself, they're real world stories. So those are the kind of things that the founders need to hear more of. It's the golden handcuffs. And, you know, you called it out there for, for someone like me as well. Like, you, you the, the risks are huge, so failure is not an option. And this work that you're doing and the team of, of experienced leaders coming in to teach is of massive value to, to any startups there. And I love the idea of getting the whole, the whole crew away from the public. It's not for show. You're not doing this for show. You're doing this purely to give as much attention and focus uh, and I'd love if you actually got everybody to turn off their phones, Andrew, as well, because that's the that's the real uh, challenge is getting away from the email and uh, your all the different WhatsApps and everything. Yeah, and in fact, you know, Spike Island as a as a as a location is just magnificent, and I actually totally recommend it for anybody to go for on a on a you know, Sunday afternoon to have a look around. It's an amazing place. I was almost disappointed when we got out there and found we had a full four G signal and there was free Wi Fi <laughs> on the island. Um, but you, but you're right. You know, providing a kind of a protected place where we can have those open conversations, I think, is really important. But I wouldn't overemphasize the risk for an entrepreneur. Entrepreneurs go into these businesses. Yes, because it's risky, but but that's not the motivation. The motivation is typically to go in and fix something that they see is broken or to build on an opportunity that they've spotted. And they're motivated about creating something wonderful, hiring a great team and you know, making some money in the process. You know, People, I think, that start off a business and say, yeah, I just want to exit in three years and make loads of money, they're typically the ones that don't succeed. The founders that actually accept that there is risk involved, but just put it to one side because they're motivated by what's the opportunity, what's the problem I'm solving, what's the customer that's saying, God, if you could only do that, I'd buy it from you. They're they're the real business leaders of the future, You know, the people that want to make something great. And typically that takes blood, sweat and tears and a lot of pain along the way. But that's fine because ultimately the rewards come and the rewards are not just financial. Yeah, absolutely. They're changing the world. They're making an impact, which is, uh, you know, it's, it's something that I, I thought about, Andrew, recently is, you know, there's a lot of talk about millennials and the fact that they're jumping from job to job. But I actually think there's something deeper at, at, at play here that actually people are looking for meaning from the company they work for. And I think that startups and founders that are genuine, like the team of people you're bringing away, are, are the ones that they work for because they believe in their product and their product is actually looking to make a change in the world. And, and the more companies we can facilitate like Startup Ireland's doing to, to make those changes, the better the business environment's gonna be in the future. 
Yeah, I completely agree. And I, I think I probably read the same article you, that you did, but you say the millennials want to work in a great company. They want to do a great job and they want to make a great difference. You know, so what, you know, when I was a rookie, uh, you got a job to make money and pay the bills and go out on a Friday night. Whereas I think, you know, the, the, the people that we're seeing going into startups and, and particularly the tech companies now, they really do want to feel like they're building something. And that kind of enthusiasm is, you know, it does have the potential to change the world. And I think you're absolutely right. If we can create the right framework conditions, uh, and this is, you know, coming back to the startup nation's policy people that are coming to Cork this weekend, that's what they do. They want to work at a macro level in their various countries, whether it's from, you know, Peru and Chile all the way to New Zealand and Korea that are coming to Cork. They're motivated by creating the macro environment that enables those business leaders and founders to actually do really well and to, and to make a difference in their home countries. We talk about entrepreneurs always being at the business end, but in some cases, you know, the entrepreneurial flair also manifests in the policymakers. Where they're taking a risk. They're recognizing that something needs to be fixed. They're going out on a limb maybe to try and make it happen. So I think you know, we should doff our cap to them sometimes as well. And what's the details, Andrew? Can the public go to this? So the um, Startup Nation Summit is happening in UCC on Saturday. Um, it's a closed session. So there's 200 and odd delegates coming together to talk about material, stuff that's relevant to them. Uh, so it's not open to the public. It is open to um, invited guests and to sponsors who are involved. And I have to acknowledge Bank of Ireland, who have been amazing uh, in terms of sponsoring both the Startup Island event and sponsoring the Startup Nation Summit. Um, so it is available to people who, who have a particular interest, but typically the conversations aren't the kind of thing that somebody would give up a Saturday afternoon to go along, particularly when there's a rugby match on that night. <laughs> the Spike Island piece is just for the startup companies, the facilitators and the mentors that are going to be there. And, and some of the mentors you know, are coming from you know, Google have been really supportive. Huawei have been amazing. They, they've sponsored and they're sending people along as well. Um, Tyco or Johnson Controls as they are now. So we've got some great companies, Microsoft included, all sending some of their brightest and best to intersperse with the startups that are there to talk through real business stories. So I think it's going to be a great weekend. Can't wait. That sounds like it, Andrew. And uh, we wish you the very best. Andrew Parrish. Director of Startup Ireland. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Aidan. So now on the Innovation Show, we all welcome Fiona Descado Kennedy, CEO of Innovate Dublin. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Aidan. Delighted to be here. It's great to have you here. So, so tell us about Innovate Dublin. Innovate Dublin is a social enterprise, and it was set up last year. And what we do is we look at identifying problems in communities in Dublin City and co-create, co-develop and co-produce solutions to those problems with individuals, particularly residents, businesses, non-profits and local government. Brilliant. And so how can, how can somebody get involved? I mean, if I had an idea, or is it a community thing or can it an is. individual come forward? I'll tell you a bit about our model. Innovate Dublin um, sets up different Innovate programs under the auspices of Innovate Dublin. Um, Dublin is huge. It has a lot of complex social problems. So we want to ensure that we have an impact on the ground and communities. So we set up Innovate Ballymun, our first program, and we wanted to understand what the issues were in the community of Ballymun. We had all the social economic data, so we knew what the deprivation indices, what the figures were associated to that. But we really wanted to put the user, the individual, back at the centre of the decision making process and the community tell us what they actually want. So within Ballymun, what we did is we did on street consultations with residents, we interviewed businesses, non profit organisations, and we came up with three themes based on their feedback and their information. One, they wanted to activate vacant spaces in their community. Two, they wanted to look at design and service design within the community and how to redesign services to better meet their needs. And three, they wanted to actually look at possibly testing products and services from the private sector in their community. And that came from the business interviews and consultations that we did. So with those three areas, we actually wanted to determine then, OK, so we have these themes. What do we actually do? What does the community want under those themes? So we set up groups of critical friends. You maybe had TDs coming along to a session, you had counsellors, but you also had, most important, the residents who live in Ballymun. So under the theme, for example, um, activating vacant spaces, entrepreneurship and growth for, for entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs was a big deal. There was no space. And what's more, there was no vacant space for people to progress. So... With planning and involving the key people that I said um, earlier on, what we did was we devised a plan for a social innovation hub in Ballymun, a space not only for social entrepreneurs, but for entrepreneurs and people who can grow, develop and 
develop their business through a co-working space in Ballymun. So we now have a social innovation hub that's 320 square meters of space and it ticks one of the boxes in terms of the activating space and space theme that was um, delivered within Ballymun. So essentially what we want to do out of anything we design is putting the user back at the center face. Um, it's not dictated by government or local government, it's di- di- dictated to by the user the individual in the community. And we pull in the expertise from local government, non-profits, businesses going forward in order to develop the solutions. That's brilliant. So, so somebody um, can spot, like, because when you think about like the Coder Dojo model as well, about like you're looking for donated space, but this is perhaps space that, you know, lost out tr- through the recession, was maybe a vibrant area. You're revitalizing that because there's direct correlation between, you know, active spaces or vibrancy or energy in a space That's and right. people's livelihood and how yes. they feel living in those yeah. areas yeah. so That's so right. you're actually beat you're you're affecting that for the positive change as well Indeed. and that has a knock-on effect on, on, on igniting creativity because we talk about creative spaces and you see a lot of you know big corporates um putting together innovation spaces of nice colors all that kind of stuff it's the same reason it ignites mm-hmm. creativity yes but um because we see, there's some of uh, some um, examples of that where donated spaces have been used as kind of creative hubs or, or innovation hubs. Mm-hmm. Drogheda, I think there's one. That's right. Yes. Yeah. So th- this is great. So in Bali, Bali Mon, where you know a lot of uh, there's been a lot of neglect, I suppose, in a, a lot of uh, impoverished areas. There's somewhere now that's a hub of energy. That's right. That people who have an idea for a business can actually come develop their business idea and grow the business idea. And we act as a facilitator or a broker to, I suppose, connect them to the local partnership, for example, Leo, the local enterprise office, or any other companies they need to be talking to in order to develop their business and grow their business. So it's development, the development of the ecosystem for entrepreneurs and social entrepreneurs within the Ballyman community. And... As time goes on, um, we're hoping that the model becomes self-sustainable. Um, we're almost breaking even after one year for the Social Innovation Hub, which is fantastic. So we're hoping to look to develop and grow that in other communities in Dublin and work with potential partners um, to grow that across the city, whether it is businesses, non-profits or local government. But we're also looking at other projects. The Social Innovation Hub is only one aspect of what we do. Um, As I said, under the theme um, prototyping products and services um, from the private sector, there's an interest to reinvigorate um, an area that was looking at manufacturing. Um, We wanted to actually get people back into understanding the awareness of what um, STEAM is, science, technology, engineering, arts and maths, and engaging them in um, working with um, development of STEAM products or services. So We've been looking at what is called a mobile makerspace. So a makerspace could be housing 3D printers, um, cutters, machines to actually develop um, products and services or design products and services. So what we want to do is design a prototype mobile makerspace that can go out into communities, can target schools, for example, so kids can go in and look at making an amplifier for their phone. Um, But they think it's cool and it's fun. But what they're actually doing is they're looking at science, they're looking at technology, they're putting arts and maths together and they're working to develop something cool and fun but learning at the same time. And it's really important through this project that we're not only doing that engaging kids in schools but engaging parents to encourage them and aware, to develop the awareness of STEAM and the importance of that going forward. Um, businesses, small businesses as well, it's very expensive to prototype and test um, whether you want to look at a new product in your product range for a business or, for example, actually look at different packaging. You have to send it off. It has to be manufactured. You have to wait for a turnaround time. Businesses, small businesses don't have the resources. They don't have the money to do that. So what we want to do is have a mobile makerspace that they can go to in their community. They can have look at um, developing a prototype, but have a turnaround time that's less than a week. And then they can determine if it's something they want to change or develop or take it to market. So the mobile makerspace is another project that we're working on um, with key partners in the local area, um, businesses and nonprofits to take that forward. So there's a range of different pro- projects that we're working on at the moment, but that's what makes Innovate Dublin so special. It's unique because we're working with the people in the community that actually want to make a change and want to make a difference. We're not um, we're not bound by government funding. We're not bound by any rules or regulations. We're doing what communities want us to do and what the residents, businesses and non-profits and local government want us to do in the community. And we're acting as a broker to facilitate that and develop the projects that matter. 
Yeah, and, and that that sense of ownership from the community is is what it's all about. I mean, if you have any innovation program in a big corporate pushed on people, or mm-hmm. I call it forced fun, if you'd forced fun weekends away and all this kind of stuff, and you know whiteboarding sessions forced on people, they won't. It's like that's not made here kind of uh, mentality. But when it's coming from them and they're they're inputting, there's a sense of ownership there and a sense of partnership. Exactly. But I, I thought it was really interesting what you said about the steam with the kids. So the kids getting embra- in, in, engulfed in this world is kind of like uh, putting medicine into their yogurt so they don't notice it. That's it. You exactly. get it in there yes, <laughs> under yeah, the radar. Yeah. But, yeah. but it's, you know, you're talking about prototyping as well. And that. I mean, you're doing that as well. You're prototyping your, yourself. You're we becoming are. the prototype yeah. that you can then roll out elsewhere around other places as well, which exactly. is fantastic. I mean, Innovate Ballymun is our first program. And essentially, yes, it's our pilot, it's our prototype. If this works, we want to scale it to other areas of Dublin City and potentially other counties. It doesn't have to be Innovate Dublin. It can be Innovate Cork. It could be Innovate Waterford. So in time... We may look at um, a growth plan going forward, but at the moment we'll just concentrate on Dublin communities and see what traction we can establish um, by working with the people in the communities to take prototypes forward. So, so your 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 model is get your set your own uh, model right. Yes. Uh, so get your model right and then move it to another area. That's which, right. which I mean, it's it's always going to adapt, and you know, it's going to adapt to the local demands, I suppose, as well. Exactly. Like if if the part the community is a partner, yes, yes. that's going to change going community to community. Exactly. It depends on what the core needs on the ground in the community are. And I think, I mean, this is, you could say it's under the realm, what we do is under the realm of social innovation. It's looking at new ways of doing things in communities. So what what we want to do is actually look at a different methodology for working in communities, looking at how we can develop um, local community um, through social innovation and using, putting the user as, i.e. the resident, back at the design of the services and systems that they want to see in their community. And I do believe this this is a different methodology that we can look at, um, potentially look at with government going forward, um, because I do think the space for looking at social innovation, social innovation um, methodologies for, for Dublin going forward. Yeah, and, and uh, so say say I'm, I'm a resident in one of those areas. Do I just walk in and just go, here, I'm Aidan, and I have this idea. Is that how it works? That's pretty much, that's it. I mean, the Social Innovation Hub is an open door hub. Anyone can come in and engage with um, the Incubate for Growth program as if you're an entrepreneur or a social entrepreneur or um, we've just established a youth program which is um, using design thinking skills um, to put the, the youth back at the decision making process for themselves. So where are they actually going? What do they need to do? Um, in Ballymun there's a lot of local service provisions um, for youth to aid them into education, training, self-employment and employment very good local organisations that have been in the community for over 25 years. But there's a large number of them and it's very difficult to, um, I suppose, find your way through these organisations. So essentially, our youth programme, Youth Academy is what it's called, is actually helping youth navigate through those service provisions and determine what is next for them. If they're receiving services from the job centre, they could be receiving services from our um, local arts um, theatre access. So... What what is next for them? Where do they want to go? Is it employment? Is it self employment? But allowing them to design that, um, and that's a fifteen week program that we're about to launch um, in late September, so they can engage the projects that we have running through the Social Innovation Hub. I was thinking when you were saying that, like, so they have a chance to almost do a hackathon on their own lives. Like, it's like, where am I going? And that's it. So many kids don't even ever get a chance to do that. Like, we we all make decisions on our CAO form for right. what we're going to do in college in a whim you know it's a, and it's you know the information behind that decision is not always rock solid it's kind of it's kind of preferences at the time without really drilling down and I suppose it's what design thinking is it's like okay let's get really to the bottom of what do I like you know oh look at it's fantastic to get That's that it. and even to get access to that skill because it mm-hmm. A lot of people in businesses and successful businesses and big MNCs, they don't get the chance to do that. No, and I didn't. I'm certain you didn't either um, previously. So I think it's something that we need to start to embed 
in communities and training programs and start locally by putting in to the realms of the Social Innovation Hub through the Incubate for Growth program that we run or the Youth Academy. Um, and it's starting small and advocating on behalf of what we're doing and getting the message out. And how did you get involved, uh, Fiona? How did you, what was your um, The background, pathway? essentially, I was um, acting CEO of the Ballymun White Tell Area Partnership up until March of last year. What happened is there was a national tender process for the mainstay program that we ran, um, same as other partnerships. And unfortunately, we lost out as part of that tender application. So the company was wound down. But in winding it down, there was an opportunity to perhaps look at taking the company in another direction. So this is what we did. Um, so I worked with the board to look at a whole new strategy to take the company forward. Um, the name of the company was changed. We looked at a whole new business plan. And Ballymun White Hill Area Partnership essentially became Innovate Dublin. Brilliant. Well, it's it's a great story and um, we wish you the very best luck and looking forward to seeing it rolling out across. If people want to get in touch and help or, or you know, suggest come to my town, where can people find you, Fiona? They can find us on www.innovatedublin.org. Well, Fiona Descatou Kennedy, CEO and founder of Innovate Dublin, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for your time. It was lovely to be here.